Um, so my name, as I just said, is uh, Samuel Lundberg, and um, together with uh, Andreas Hermansson and Andreas Hiller, uh, we started our practice then about 10 years ago in 2010. Um, we studied together at the School of Architecture at the KTH and then uh, and also did some exchanges to Madrid and Berlin and, and then after we graduated we started working together uh, quite soon and then we formed a practice in 2010. Um, we are now eight architects uh, in Stockholm in Southern Malm, this part of Stockholm um, where we are sitting in an uh, old uh, tobacco factory. And today, today, tonight I will be talking about our work and perhaps more about our interests and methods and our view on architecture and how that shapes our, our work. So I chose as a sort of a title for this um, some, some words you can see here. And I will be talking about a number of projects and also about a number of architecture ideas. Um, we tend to work with different formal qualities and materials depending on the task and the context. There are many themes that we are interested in, such as these um, that you can see on the screen. Uh, we return to them in different ways to develop our projects and the architectural forms and building elements. Uh, each project tends to touch on just some of these elements or some of these themes. So while some projects can be quite similar, uh, many projects also turn out quite different from each other. Uh, for us, the history of architecture is a very present thing, and um, we are constantly influenced by buildings we see and experience and, and discuss. And um, this is especially true for the fantastic heritage we have here in Stockholm, from, uh, from the, especially from the early 20th century. Uh, so here we see examples of the National Romanticism with Östberg and Lallerstedt and uh, Wahlman and Boberg. And here, of course, we admire their um, strong sculptural power and formal inventiveness. Um, in the uh, famous Nordic classicism of the 20s and 30s, uh, of course, we had the names of Asplund and Leverens, but we also have Engbom and Bergsten and many, many more. And it is a kind of a particular kind of, of classicism, endlessly fascinating for us. Um, it always remains critical graceful and temperate, often working with simple materials, and maintaining a tension between harmony and something that's more queer or detached. And the 20s and 30s were a tumultuous time, and Sweden was still a very poor country. Um, and yet this uh, wonderful architecture thrived, um, also for simple tasks like uh, housing. And then in the uh, post, uh, war era, Sweden transformed into this rich welfare state we have now. And this massively changed the building industry and the role of the architect. During this time, there was still a small number of architects such as uh, Selsing, Erskine, Kiselius and Edman, who still managed to maintain a searching and questioning attitude and do exceptional, subtle, sophisticated and intriguing buildings. This history our uh, heritage is uh, combined for us with the ongoing discussions we have when we work and experience things. Uh, and this very much form a center for our work. But the previous slide um, that listed our concepts and themes or ideals, you might say, or interests, uh, that is what we as architects bring with us into the process of construction. But, um, and those themes also sort of connect us to that golden period of, of, of Swedish architecture in a sense. And, but this list, the, these words you see here, are um, in a sense what we see as the major conditions that have led us to a deterioration of building culture into what we could almost call a leaden age instead uh, from which we are trying to uh, work ourselves up. So the industrialized building process and many times means that buildings uh, never involve any craft but are only in this industrialized assembly. Of course, the marking driven logic uh, this defines our um, value only in material or monetary terms. Um, the rules and regulations and standards have a huge impact and are kind of drivers for uniformity rather than 
uh, exploration. And of course, uh, clients and authorities have always been uh, important, but nowadays they are less invested in building as culture and more uh, in process, you might say. So um, we are a uh, small but um, hardworking practice. We got commissions from many different sources and we rarely decline a commission. Looking back, if we um, look at the last 10 years, we have probably started around 40 projects every year. So we're around the 400 projects now. And of course, many of these never come to fruition or go very far and some go all the way. So, but the, the fact that we are dealing with many projects at the same time, is very much uh, our experience as a, as a practice. So today I will focus mostly on the current and or some, can, some current and recent projects. Uh, and rather than focus on anyone too um, deeply or thoroughly, I will try to show how they deal with these themes and conditions. Of course, it's uh, impo impossible to summarize or explain ourselves, that's for others to do. Um, but we feel that we, when we uh, talk about ourselves, we, we, we don't really um, start by a reduction to any particular project or, or concept. So perhaps we are, or you could say we are more um, going towards uh, both and rather than either or, um, and that we see architecture as a constant pursuit of um, richness and complexity. So I will go into some projects. And uh, the first project is a student, student pro uh, housing project that we are doing the, the final drawing on, on this, um, the construction drawings this fall. Um, it's, uh, it's in Charitop, which is a suburb to Stockholm. It's on the green subway line to the south. It was built in the 40s, 50s, a very sort of uh, centrally planned uh, suburb with a very modest, nice um, apartment building flanking this uh, central square where you arrived from the subway. That square is here in this um, aerial photograph, if you can see. And our site is, is just to the left of that, on this uh, green thing in the center. Um, this is a hilly, a rocky hillside, you can say, a uh, great level of difference between the road and, and the top of this um, rock. And um, we proposed some student housing here. Um, and um, this was a good, Typology to, to be able to, to solve also the access to this difficult site. And in a sense, you can say that a lot of this project has been, uh, ha has had to do with grappling with some um, grammars aspect of mid century modernism, in a sense. So um, we have had this sort of linear blocks, and then we divided the program in, in three blocks um, in this orientation, and then subdivided them in three different blocks which are staggered in plan and, and section. And this actually um, climbs quite organically up the, the hill and has the access to the road on that um, along the street. Um, on the facade treatments, we have echoed some of the themes you find in Sertop Centrum, uh, where they had a, perhaps a, a more modest grid with some windows and, and different colors. And we have added a kind of geometric pattern of colored plaster or render um, to order the facades. So in our treatment of the facades, we, we have this perhaps slightly more expressionistic um, element of, of color and geometry. And also the windows are juxtaposed to, to, to heighten the effect. So uh, that sort of plays on, on that architecture in, in Sarto, but the interior, of course, is, is very um, much along the lines of the sort of modernist blocks uh, because we have all these similar units of the student housing along the corridor. And of course, uh, one of the uh, formal problems of modernism is how, how do you end the linear block? And of course, in many times, the question was that you simply had a kind of a corridor window at the end, um, which felt like um, uh, perhaps not the strongest uh, solution. But in our case, since we had these um, gables towards the, the street, we decided to, to um, use the sort of muteness of these uh, cut-off gables um, and um, work with this expressive scheme that we had in the, in the other facades and have a kind of a colossal 
uh, or, uh, ornamentation on these uh, facades framing the central windows. Also adding a shallow arcade along the street, we, we had a, a little bit of uh, urban injection along this, uh, along this street. Um, another project, uh, the next project is uh, a lo rather large uh, conversion project. It's, um, um, it's a uh, office building from the 90s that was, uh, it, this was built as offices in the 90s in an old industrial suburb, but, but they're all now being converted into housing. And our client had, had this um, quite uh, extraordinary building, bought and had an internal uh, competition for that, which we won, and then we have worked everything until the, the finished building. So um, that building was actually built for only two uh, different um, big companies, and because of the, how the street goes and how we have the, all these terrain aspects, uh, you can only an, really enter the building on, on two parts, but um, this is quite a large building, so it would be, uh, we had to change it to, to work for a lot of um, apartments. Uh, the, the difficult thing is also that because of the terrain, um, every floor is different because of the terrains and the arcade and then the sort of setbacks coming um, going back from the sea. So we had to work a lot with the plants to be able to sort of master all these conditions. Of course, also uh, all the measurements are optimized for offices and not for, um, for, for housing. Um, so in 200 apartments, we had to have 70 different uh, apartment types. So it was a very complex scheme, but uh, a lot of the things in the um, project had to do with the exterior, and we tried to always solve the plans so that we could have uh, some certain aspects in the exterior. And what we wanted to do is we found this element in the existing building, which was this beam over the windows, this kind of Aldo Rossi-like beam, where um, um, the windows was framed like that. and we added this um, vertical pilaster of new steel, and then we could have the, the windows um, subdivided in a ways that would fit all the different kinds of apartments that we have and so on. So we tried to have that, and then we could split the windows in three or four and have the pilasters in different positions um, to be able to have a kind of a unified uh, hole uh, on this brick uh, building. And we actually enhanced some part of the regularity of the building so for instance, there were some parts that were, were not uh, part of a kind of an open grid because they had signage and such on them. So we took up some new holes uh, in the facade which uh, were made to look like uh, all the existing ones earlier and so on. So this is uh, a bit of the effect that you have from the street uh, with all these new uh, partitions and, and uh, windows. And you can see here the, the T-shaped elements. Um, so basically we we found a lot of this sort of excellent brickwork and the steel beams to be something that would give the uh, character of this new ensemble. And then we added this uh, one story, um, uh, almost penthouse like uh, additions on top and they follow this sort of step character of the building. But they, on, they not only relate to the step character of the building, they also relate in the uh, their own order to the regular grid of the facade, so that there are kind of on a half half rhythm there, uh, and they also take up this game of of pilaster and beam. So the um, um, the uh, one story additions on top uh, have a kind of a facade more explicitly made of of a composition of horizontal and, and vertical building elements, and they are uh, that effect perhaps is heightened by this. Um, we use this kind of extra large uh, cupola boats uh, that would give this, uh, heighten this sort of uh, industrial association. So we had a kind of a, um, a certain relief in the facade, a kind of composition there of, of vertical and, and horizontal elements. And it was not only the facade, but a lot of other things which were also kind of a steel, uh, product in that sense. And then 
Uh, of course, this project in many ways was kind of a very nice project. You had the, the great views uh, to the water and of course also to the back. Um, and uh, so in that sense, uh, this was a, um, a very nice project uh, in that sense. You can, you can see a little bit about the relation to the surroundings, which uh, this sort of step back effect uh, leads that the building, which is actually rather large, appear quite uh, gentle. Um, the next project is, uh, has very, it doesn't have that kind of glamorous um, situation. It's much more of a condition that we find ourselves most of the times. And I would say that uh, perhaps most of the, the practices working in Europe find themselves in this kind of conditions uh, most of the time. It's this kind of a no context context in a sense. There, there are no clear grammars. Um, there are some mix, mixes of everything. It's not so dense. It's not so... Uh, there is no clear sort of urban direction or, or um, let's say, vernacular uh, character or anything like that. It's kind of a, a low density mix. Um, so there on our site, we, um, we had a program, we had some conditions that were very fixed and some that were very loose. So the shape of the building was very fixed um, from the zoning plan and also from the, um, and also the, the, the mode of construction was fixed from the beginning. Uh, to be made by this kind of wooden volume elements and also clad with fiber cement. So um, working with the client, we had to make so many different way. Um, on the upper floors, there were all the different kind of uh, living you could have. And on the lower floor, there were uh, a lot of different. Um, in the end, it turned out to be rental apartments above and a kind of assisted living units uh, on the on the ground floor and this is these are the materials that we uh, that were basically the one we we were available to use and these are kind of not very uh, you know um, not the, the 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 most fancy of materials it is this kind of fiber cement with with wood um, uh, patterns and also bitumen roofs and, and things like that and um, we tried to take those um, kind of flimsy materials and also the sort of uh, the things we had to use also in the plan to, to adhere to these industrial aspects of the, the volumes um, and make a building that had some regularity and also some different characters. So uh, we managed to make, have the client make give us some small incisions here in the middle of the long side and on the corner so we could divide it a little bit in different volumes. And then we had something that we can calibrate the effect along the street uh, and, and on the um, height difference. And with the facade that we um, developed this kind of checkerboard uh, character, we um, uh, thought that this facade did both in, in a sense, uh, perhaps start with the kind of assembledness of the building and a little bit with the materials and that construction um, uh, you know, technique, but also the effect is is quite uh, nice on the street. It it gives some some kind of um, a character or or a specificity to to the building along the street. And you have some effects where the different colors uh, and patterns sort of uh, meet and clash a little bit uh, on the different. Um, and of course, uh, the facade is reminiscent of uh, Lachen's uh, Page Street housing um, that you have in, in London. And uh, it's uh, interesting, of course, that perhaps he thought that was, was a kind of a low budget uh, housing um, uh, scheme. But this, of course, uh, uh, nowadays, most housing schemes are, are very much more uh, restricted. Um, I think in, in some, uh, from some angles uh, in some parts, so you can find a kind of a intriguing, uh, gentle uh, monumentality along this, um, in some of these volumes. Uh, and I think uh, the overall effect is, is quite nice on the, on the street and the um, effect it has on the surroundings. Uh, the next part is very different in, in the relation to the scale of the, of the project and also how it deals with scale. So this is a, a summer house on an island outside Stockholm. It's uh, 
uh, all made in wood. Um, and most summer houses, uh, they tend to try to um, be fitted to the site in a sense and, and try to dissolve the, the boundary between outside and inside is, is a common theme. Um, and here we try to do something a bit different where we would uh, keep and, and um, work with the delineation between nature and architecture in a, where we would try to keep some kind of tension between the two. And um, the effect of the thing has uh, aspects more of perhaps generality than individuality, and, and this gave a, a rather interesting effect. Um, the, the siting is very, very simple. Two volumes with the same facade treatment together with a rock. They form a kind of a court or interior uh, space. Um, the plan is quite relaxed in relation to the strictness of the facade. In the facade, uh, windows of the same size are interspersed with piers of the same width as the windows. And this goes around the buildings, even when there are no windows, there are blind windows. So, um, and perhaps there are some connections to farm buildings or, or that kind of thing where you sometimes have quite uh, severe facades and, and quite relaxed uh, contents in, inside. Um, the piers themselves, that they have a kind of a expressed vertical character. Um, they, uh, they form buildings um, and there are no uh, terraces or porches that sort of project themselves out into the uh, landscape in the Baroque or uh, modernistic way. Instead, the building is rather um, restrained. Um, Making the building of wood and prefabricating everything made also uh, this order. Um, they work together in a nice way. This is one of the corner details. Uh, you can see here some of the construction images where you can see these sort of wooden uh, or wall blocks made by wood, very simple ones being put together. And then we had this um, massive wood triangular facade treatments also mounted on a um, Mm, assemble them or uh, put into place uh, outside those. Uh, everything was kind of a very rational and nice uh, assembly, which only took a few days. But perhaps what's interesting in the project is that when you have this kind of monumental building parts in these domestic settings, it creates a, a slightly unusual effect. Mm, and there are the, some of these elements that are not that big, but they do have a rather peculiar uh, effect. Some uh, aspect of these um, uh, piers are, they, they resemble perhaps the kind of fluted um, pilaster and the kind of cornice at the top is very slender. And in relation to the robustness of the piers, you have a kind of a ambiguous trabeation, uh, which also perhaps uh, influences the effect a little bit. The next project is, um, it's not a build project, it's a competition that we did a few years ago that kind of influenced a lot of our thinking about a lot of different things. It was a competition for facades, really, in, in Lübeck, in North Germany. Uh, I don't know if you, if you know anything about Lübeck, but it's a very uh, kind of a charming, uh, well-preserved uh, town. Uh, of course, Lübeck was big in the Hanseatic League, so it's uh, old history. Uh, and the, the competition was for these two blocks just west of the Marienkirche, uh, which were the only parts that were bombed in the Second World War. And they were replaced by some trade schools uh, in the 50s, and now they want to tear them down and, and rebuild the original plot structure. And therefore, they wanted to have a competition for the facades. Uh, the rest of Lübeck is, is based on a kind of a manual that UNESCO has taken um, or made that re regulates everything that you can do on these historic uh, parts. And we, a condition was that we had to use that uh, also for these new uh, builds. So the plots could be of different sizes. So the task was to make three different facades. So you, you didn't really know so much about what kind of building would come would be built behind them. Uh, and they didn't know which building would stand next to which and so on. So 
we um, started investigating these kind of um, um, aspects of the uh, what does a, what does uh, what sort of makes a house what are the elements that, that are used in the historic architecture and the classical architecture and so on and um, what uh, what kind of architectural devices could we use to achieve this sort of balance between the individual buildings and the overall form of the city and we started to work with the jam sort of windows so we had this kind of a uh, plastic approach uh, where we worked with either concave or convex or, or stepped forms uh, and we used that around the windows and also um, applied them to the gable gables as well um, so we had a kind of a unusual but still kind of um, recognizable effect uh, of combination between the sort of overall character and the surround sort of windows um, so each house gained a kind of a particular character uh, while at the same time, time adhering to the overall harmony of the uh, development. We hope that the facades will be able to meet each other and also unknown facades uh, while retaining <coughs> sorry, retaining their own um, integrity, so to say. But you can say that the formal <coughs> the formal devices that we used were uh, kind of basic and, and simple ones. We used the form of the jams, as I said, and we also had the, the proportions of the windows, the sort of perceived per height of the ground floor. Uh, we had some minor horizontal uh, projections, and then we had a subtle composition of render colors. And this uh, enabled a quite rich um, combination between this uh, simple quite uh, minimalistic really uh, building. So in relation to that uh, UNESCO manual, which was of course was never intended to be used for uh, you know, new designs, we felt that it was an interesting way to, to think about the uh, open interpretation of history and, and which uh, devices actually have which effect. Because of course there are no uh, strictly classical details in any of these buildings. It's only very basic uh, forms. and it's more about the composition and this um, relates to another project of ours which was uh, uh, also a project that hasn't been built it's more of a kind of a investigative project where um, we were tasked to uh, make some buildings with uh, extremely small apartments you might say which would be used by probably more people than were intended so we did these kind of two-room apartments in th of 35 square meters and the three-room apartments of 50 square meters, uh, that kind of size uh, requirements. And we did some more um, pieces of the puzzle, let's say. And you could configure them in different ways if you had uh, smaller halls and more um, stairs or if you had longer corridors and such. And they sort of this came together uh, to become a, a very sort of efficient, um, super efficient block. And then we were, of course, looking at how would we work with the facade. So in a sense, this turned into almost a kind of meditation on the separation of the plan and the facade. In a sense, because if if this was to be a, a, a house that would could be used in, in really be really efficient and be used many times. Uh, it could also have a lot of different facades. Um, so we, in a similar way to that earlier competition, we tried to investigate a lot the different ways to, uh, you know, subdivide, articulate the different uh, building elements or precede building elements rather. Uh, it's also a kind of a, a interesting part of our discussion about, let's say, tectonic uh, devices, which we feel are kind of really kind of rhetoric uh, devices uh, in a sense. So you have that kind of balance what you can sort of um, feel that they are saying or what they are perhaps doing. Um, where another uh, study was of brick. You have this uh, sort of simple order of, of bricks in different ways. And then you have plaster. And you can really see with the plaster that with some colors, some, some recesses, some implied uh, tectonics, you, you get a rather rich uh, facade. Um, 
So in a sense, all the, these uh, three uh, facades for the same plan uh, almost brought us back to the um, to that um, let's say old rule of the architect of, of devising facades that would sort of enrich the um, environment a little bit, almost detached from the, the plans, which perhaps were already worked out. And one of the thing, things we saw was that plaster, which of course, and render, whichever is the best English word, um, is of course a material that's quite often used nowadays, but um, it also many times doesn't feel that um, innovative, or doesn't lend itself so easily to uh, a varied architecture, uh, but we feel felt a lot in this uh, project when investigating these things that quite simple means you can have a kind of a quite uh, well balanced um, overall effect uh, where you could have uh, quite interesting um, smaller situations that would sort of relate between each other uh, in in the uh, development of, of those projects in different places. Uh, I will go through the next project, which is a competition that we did last year, and it was for three blocks, and we won these two blocks, uh, which was a, it's a kind of a new uh, plaza next to a suburban train station. Um, so it's kind of um, uh, in the Periphery of Stockholm, uh, it's a like a local um, densification project, uh, and these blocks are kind quite dif difficult or different. Sorry. So one is a kind of straightforward um, residential building, and it has a, which has a, some public functions towards the square. The other one is kind of it's called a mobility house. It means that it has a lot of parking for all the different buildings and other. Um, people that want to come and leave the car and, and take the communal train instead. So it has a lot of parking, it has a hotel, it has a residential tower, and then it has a kind of a full floor of commercial things for the square, for the level of the square. Um, this is the square form between these two buildings opening up to this sort of open bridge going out to the, um, to the uh, train station. And of course, uh, and then you have this height difference over the uh, tracks. Um, as is often the case, uh, when you have a, con a competition or if you have a process, you have some proposals and it has to be adapted for wh whichever reasons. And here, um, these higher levels, this kind of tower effect uh, got taken down a bit. And then we worked on that other facade. So these are the, uh, facades as they stand now. It's a wooden wooden facade which has been subdivided and arranged to, to have a kind of um, uh, order based on repetition which of course relates to the fact that it's really these kind of mi micro uh, apartments uh, which are kind of similar. Um, this is the effect towards that square. You have the um, the play of vertical and horizontal in the wooden uh, wooden facade, and they have a kind of a robust uh, concrete um, plinth towards uh, the square. The other building is a, a, a bit more complex. We had, as I said, the parking, the commercial thing, and then the hotel and the residential part. And this creates some conditions for a bit more fluid and um, um, well complex uh, relation between the because it is a block and then there are some parts that have a kind of a, a, a design or a expression that is uh, kind of unique for that part. And then that sort of subtly influences some other part because they share the same uh, aspects and the same uh, perimeter and so on. And this is a part of the hotel towards the square where you can see this Kind of ornamental, ornamentally used windows uh, reflected in the uh, ornamentation on the facade, creating this kind of um, uh, 
well, uh, interwoven effect uh, by using this kind of just plaster uh, reliefs and, and uh, colors. Another aspect that, that is often comes uh, into play when we're doing it with this kind of housing elements are these, um, they kind of, this is kind of, a, this is the block we are working on here. Is This is another development on the edge of Stockholm. Um, this is a rather large block. It has a not unusual new urban uh, condition. It has a, a kind of a big road here and then it is open to the backside. And then the question of course arises a little bit like which, which architecture uh, are you using for this kind of um, building? So on the site we divided, uh, we had a kind of a front towards the street and we divided in different kind of volumes. Um, but we tried to find this balance between uh, towards the street working with some subtly different colors and volumes, having different uh, facade treatments on the sides and this kind of stepped effect towards this open park of we had a kind of a colossal order um, uh, making this kind of double story drop uh, different kind of facade and then you have the the tower which has a, a grid like structure of its own so uh, towards the street this um, facade are also used in this kind of implied tectonics ordering um, with some other, um, let's say, uh, rhythm displacement of, of where to put the windows and so on. Um, on the tower, there is a bit more of a, this kind of plastic effect um, towards the, the courtyard. It's a different kind of grid. And then along this um, backside, you, you see this differently colored um, double height uh, ordered volumes. Um, and I think the effect, if you compare this uh, kind of block to the that uh, second project I showed, which was this uh, quite um, strictly regular building all around, um, I think in many contemporary urban situations, we have these conditions where we have a rather large ensemble, but it doesn't really have that, it's not that big or doesn't have that kind of density where uh, a kind of a consequent or, or very regular effect would have the best um, impact. And in fact, uh, perhaps you can see a little bit of this uh, in relation to this project, which was a, a competition that we are invited competition that we won for this site, which is in the center of this image. And this is kind of also one of those uh, slightly outside kind of um, situations, but this had a, a bit of extra density because it's going to have a a subway station here, uh, the subway is being developed uh, towards this. And because of that subway connection, it's going to have a rather high density. Uh, so we felt we had the possibility to relate to some very different kinds of, uh, you know, structures such as this kind of ensembles of blocks, uh, as in uh, New York or, or London. We also felt a kind of composition of, of, of forms uh, could have a kind of a public public center in a sense. So we worked out this composition of four kind of blocks uh, tightly composed around this kind of uh, um, plaza. Um, and this is an effect mediating a little bit between this modernistic towers on top and then the expressed uh, wish to have a kind of a urban facade along this uh, street. So it, we tried to, to, to make it fit both uh, conceptions in a sense. And uh, the form, the two of the towers are much higher and the other ones are lower. And we also tried to find uh, expression on all the four um, slabs that would sort of work for the different departments, different uh, aspects and so on, and, and have this kind of more muscular uh, plastic effect perhaps. Uh, and um, perhaps there are some elements here where we discussed, of course, some of these um, lessons you can take from places like the Barbican, which has a kind of a, a, a strong uh, sculptural uh, 
quality and you have a lot of um, affinities and uh, disparities between the different parts. But you can also have something much gentler like uh, Perez uh, Le Havre, where you have the, the, the super big blocks having these kind of devices of uh, double or triple height colossal orders, uh, sort of keeping them together, dividing them, and relating the scale. Um, what we also worked with here was this kind of enormous uh, columns or pilasters in the facade where the, the apartments would meet. So um, this gave actually quite delightful conditions for the apartments. You can have this different kind of um, balconies and you had this effect that you, from the inside you would just see this kind of rough uh, structure on the on this uh, great uh, square piers um, and how they were spaced towards the street uh, because of the plants also they had a wider uh, measurement and then in this interior courtyard there was a bit of more of a compression and and um, a more uh, condensed uh, space on top they sort of released themselves from the uh, from the facade and, and were able to be read as sort of freestanding elements. So we can have this kind of almost archaic, uh, yet um, quite modern uh, arcade at the top, uh, looking out over the city. Um, so there were a lot of kind of larger scale housing projects here, but we also work with um, care homes and uh, preschools and, and these kinds of programs. And this is, um, care home in the south of Sweden, where um, these were some care buildings from the 70s that had to be demolished. And the task was to do a new one on this site. And uh, we started looking at this building, which was an existing building, a kind of a small scale, very, very sort of gentle, modernistic town hall from the 40s, 50s, which had a uh, this kind of roof and, and had a very nice detailing and so on. So we tried to make something that that, that learned some parts from this uh, building and at the same time we tried to break it up into different volumes uh, connected with this uh, linking elements. Um, the fact is that care homes are, if we go back to that um, slide with the, the words on, on the sort of restrictions or conditions that we have to work with care homes are actually among the most restricted uh, types you can you can work with they're driven both by you know of course care necessity but also a kind of efficiency or market driven logic in a sense uh, on how to make it uh, you know economically efficient to provide care and so on so and if you if you go around the people who are uh, living there are often very very old and frail and it's uh, many times are rather uh, to be honest, uh, depressing places you can come to. And what we always try to do when we, um, and many times it feels like there is a kind of a strive for efficiency also, like and uh, simplicity, like you would have a, a double-sided corridors with rooms on each side or things like that. So we try to inject some spatial uh, richness into uh, these uh, facilities because many times the people who live there here they don't have any agency to go about or, or perhaps they, they're being helped to move a little bit inside the, the ward or, or go out further inside the, the complex. So we tr try always to find different aspects in different directions so you can have a little bit of special variation inside the, the ward as well. And then working with the having some place which is like a communal hall, some kind of a winter garden or covered uh, space which uh, is possible to just go for a break or, or meet things, uh, persons or have some kind of program and also that the ambulatory spaces have a more kind of open character rather than this kind of efficient uh, corridors. All this uh, we hope will bring some kind of um, spatial richness and uh, dignity to the, the, the facilities that are often very uh, you know, circumscribed in that sense. Um, on the facade, we tried to make a very, um, we tried to take up some of these sort of uh, gentle, modernistic uh, thing, uh, characters, having some of these roof forms and also some 
orders in the facade. So we use different colored bricks to um, have different sort of patterns on the facade and also working with this kind of interweaving of red and dark brick, uh, both around these uh, parts and also around the openings of the, the windows to have a, an effect of that. And as you can see here in the, this uh, uh, specimen, you can uh, see a little bit of the beginning of the effect that, that is going to go up now when they are building it. Another project is the, uh, another similar in a sense, uh, project is also care home. Uh, this is a much more difficult to perhaps appreciate um, complex from the early 80s, late 70s perhaps. It's been broken down, it's very diffuse. Uh, it's trying to fit into this sort of small scale surroundings perhaps. Um, so on the inside here in the courtyard, there were some small buildings that were um, damaged and had to be re replaced. And they also wanted a extension. So we designed a, a rather large extension here that together with the existing four complex creates some new possibilities. So interior courtyard, and also this kind of winter garden that we, or atrium space that we discussed earlier. Um, these are our additions, and this forms a bit more kind of different circulation. And we're also using a little bit like new things in the old uh, part, which are subtly changing some of the parts. So these are the parts we are extending, where we have been sort of using the language or some grammar, you might say, of the existing thing with yellowish brick and some white details. And we're using this in different ways. This is a kind of a composite image, some, some parts of the older part, some, some of the new ones in different ways. And these are some slightly remade parts of the old uh, complex, and then with some other added parts. This is also then the sort of atrium uh, courtyard. Um, another kind of type, which is uh, the preschool, uh, is also uh, something we have to build a lot in Sweden nowadays. Um, and um, there are a lot of um, facilities being built that are quite large. So this is uh, this is such one such. Um, it's eight eight wards or eight units. So it's going to be for about 120 children. Um, and um, what we have done here is, is to work with a kind of a, a, a module of, a, of two wards together. Uh, they then go together and they form around some communal um, activities. And then they are arranged along this sort of meandering walkway, which open up into this interior uh, plaza. So also on the exterior, uh, in this project we have tried to make parts of the building have a kind of a rather distinct and, well, house-like like character, I guess you can say. Working with wood uh, also here. Um, you can see here some, let's say, different languages used at the same time. So you have this kind of pilasters in a sense, and then you have the um, this sort of dark, deep, um, deep colors for the wooden facade. And then you have this light, light colored um, detailing, and then you have a part, some ornamental windows, uh, which has a kind of a slightly different um, form logic. And between, so some of the parts of of, that you can see in the, in the plan are going to be read as rather almost freestanding crisp volumes. And then there are sort of linking volumes that in a complex way sort of take up different parts of different things. So they come together in a more uh, ambiguous way, choosing some elements from uh, some parts and some from some other parts. So there's a mix there of, uh, of, of, of clarity and, and ambiguity. Uh, these are also some um, outdoor sleeping areas for the children, where they also have this kind of open air ornamental window. And if you compare that to another, uh, um, preschool of about the same size. Uh, this is or organized in a completely different way. So here, uh, the individual ward, wards are not expressed um, in, in, in that kind of way. 
Instead, everything is uh, trying to be a kind of a unified volume. So basically you have older and smaller children on either side and they are organized around internal, you might say, uh, holes or uh, internal process. So everything is covered by a very, very large roof. You can see here some of the lines um, in the facade. It's a rather, um, um, rather, rather large roof. Uh, inside that volume, you can find the sort of uh, internal plazas sort of sticking up. And then you can see a bit here of the exterior where everything is um, using kind of different kinds of green. And I think what we have experienced uh, working with wood, it's that it's um, interesting material. Also, uh, one aspect is that it, it can be a very rich uh, material to use in combination with different forms and orders and colors. But of course, many times wood is, is used many times in a kind of a natural state, which is also can be very nice. Uh, but it feels like there is a great um, richness in, in using um, color uh, together with this sort of uh, both ornamental and structural elements you can have in, in wood. Um, so this is a kind of a liminal space towards uh, the outside where the children have, have this kind of an arcade. Uh, some other facade details on this are, uh, this is like one of these um, communal spaces then top lit and opening up to all the different rooms around it. Um, so now I will <coughs> move on to some um, perhaps projects that I will go through a little quicker who um, are, let's say, going more towards the civic potential or the public nature. And of course, uh, some of this, uh, this is something that is, uh, we're working towards uh, have making more of those kinds of projects uh, as well as the other ones. So this is perhaps um, uh, more of a um, investigation in different uh, possibilities. This was a competition in Denmark. One of those kinds of competitions we didn't, um, get any recognitions from our pr proposal, but I felt it was an interesting um, <coughs> uh, interesting uh, proposal nonetheless. And I think one of the things is that if you look at the conditions, this is a new built area on a formal industrial harbor estate south of Copenhagen. And actually what you can see here on the location that the church was to have was this actually is kind of a rich urban setting, you have the canal, you have this road, you have water, this internal street. There are a lot of different uh, aspects there that you many times don't really get in new, um, new semi-urban developments uh, around the cities. So basically we try to, of course, solve the program, creating um, the sort of appropriate spatial characters for the uh, sacred spaces and also having these sort of um, other spaces sur surrounding that. So on the lower part, we have a lot of functions sort of serving the, the, the big church space. On the upper part, it's more of a sort of a culture institution possibility. And then there is uh, the pastoral offices and some um, bell towers and some outdoor um, ceremonial structures. So uh, these kinds of investigations into, well, spatial richness and variation, this is the main hall towards this sort of high light space that you have in the front. That high space can be divided from the other ones by lowering these uh, partitions. And then you have a very different kind of space. Um, in the ambulatory spaces, we have a rather, uh, you know, modest uh, aspect uh, coming together and now have a bit more rough uh, effect in this sort of communal uh, spaces. Um, this is the outdoor uh, ceremonial space. These are the volumes from the uh, from the sea, uh, from the city, and then from uh, this sort of inter or smaller street. Um, and I think it's in interesting to see that, of course, uh, what, what is interesting in these um, uh, what, what public programs that have a lot more difference built into them than the, the housing task is, of course, um, it's possible to have a lot more uh, differentiated articulation 
and work with scale. Um, one of the uh, interesting projects we've had loss um, lately has been a, a little bit along in, in this direction. It was an investigation for a new central station in Kalmar, which is a, a city on the coast of Sweden. Uh, it has a very nice uh, central. Uh, this is the old center with a Baroque plan, and then you have uh, this uh, very uh, interesting castle. But and here the the train go all the way in here and sort of ends here uh, in an old uh, sort of small town central station. Um, so sometime in the future, in perhaps 40 years or something like that it was probably going to be necessary to be the new central station here because otherwise the city won't be able to, to develop. So we were tasked by uh, giving that uh, shape. Um, this is a kind of a industrial area that is going to be uh, made into uh, housing eventually. And our task was uh, to make a first, the first step is going to be a kind of what they call a platform station. It's really just a stop along the tracks and then at some point it's going to be expanded into uh, uh, the new central station. And then we thought, well, the central station is interesting because it's a very sort of short and emotional place still. Uh, and, and we have a lot of great, you know, uh, memories and association with different, the great uh, stations like Milano, Centrale, or Atocha uh, station and um, Helsinki. But um, of course, we also had this sort of minor uh, things also in, in, in the minor cities. Uh, and of course one of the things was that many modern new stations are built as a very efficient and nice uh, place but they're not very memorable. And whereas in the, lots of these sort of old structures you have a very emotionally charged uh, space and um, dramatic use of you know architectural and spatial effects. Um, so we thought that Perhaps it was, would be interesting if something as central to a, a, a city as their central station had to be moved, that they should have a kind of a new spatial richness uh, combined with that. So this is the condition. And what we felt was important was that when we started looking at this is the situation for the central station, uh, all the tracks that are necessary at that time, and this is the uh, traffic situation that you have to, to, to come and go there. Uh, so we started by designing the sort of central station that it's going to become. And then we thought that the, the first station that's going to be built, which is more like some, some, um, some roofs uh, along the existing tracks and a very small sort of waiting hall kind of thing, uh, they would be related. So we would try to build as much of the later things um, earlier on. So then we can have this as a kind of a fragment of the of the building to that is going to, to be built later uh, in the sense that you would build the uh, churches in the middle ages for a long time and, and things like that. So you could have a kind of a impressive fragment for a long time. And this we felt would be important that because if this is going to be used for let's say 30 years this smaller uh, station, then the city is going to grow up around this um, sort of tiny station and it's going to be formed. And we thought that even this sort of middle period, they should be able to build the city and attach some, some value to that uh, space. And then that would be sort of fulfilled when they build the central station and move it there. Um, so the function in the uh, platform station is very, small, uh, the station is also not very big, but we thought we would try to arrange it in a way to get a, one kind of, um, uh, well, evocative space in a sense. So this is the sort of fragmented uh, stage of the smaller uh, part. Uh, it's going to, it has a peculiar logic scene of, of its own. Um, and then when it's being built as a central station, you can perhaps see, see more clearly the, the, the structure. But you would have the same section uh, in the beginning, on, in the cross section, and in the long section, you can see uh, how the, the small uh, building would be um, 
kind of peculiar proportion. And this, you can see in the section, is, is the sort of uh, one of the important elements of this, uh, because it's going to be a kind of a station where you have to go under the tracks in the tunnel. And then when you do that and you would enter the central station, we felt it would be appropriate to have a kind of a, a vertical, uh, kind of romantic um, aspect of sort of attaching to the station, like when you're coming and going to the station that you would feel that this would be appropriate uh, for the, something as a new central station. And this is the sort of waiting hall. This is the um, outside aspect of the central station uh, face. And this is the fragmented sort of platform um, stage where you can see the kind of exposed structure on the side. And this is just the uh, entrance facade of the uh, finished station, so to say. So if they were to go in this direction, it could be built perhaps in about 40 years from now. So this is a really long time span. Uh, but I, I think that the um, important uh, thing here, I think, was, and it was interesting that the people we worked with in the municipality were very positive around this, that, um, that a, a central station should have some kind of a, well, spatial um, exuberance, perhaps, uh, or, or evocative uh, aspect. Um, I will um, finish up with some small projects, uh, which this is an interesting project for us, which is one of the few times we are actually allowed or have been able, should I say, to work in this kind of rich historic setting. It's a small uh, Swedish city called Vestervik. This is a kind of a old uh, courthouse from the late 18th century and by other accounts. And uh, on the side there, there was always, always different kinds of ancillary spaces. Um, you can see part of it here. And the courthouse is facing the square, and then there is a kind of commercial street with lower buildings. Uh, this is our addition, um, having a bit of a distance to the courthouse. And uh, these are um, its, um, its shape. Um, and this is uh, when you see it in context. So this really has a kind of a house-like shape, uh, house-like shape, and it relates to this kind of two-story um, developments that are very present around here, even in this sort of 60s um, commercial building standing also on the square. It actually only contains um, sort of fragments of a building. It's like a, a garbage room and some public toilets and some uh, storage space and a ventilation space. So it's a very sort of prosaic building. And therefore, uh, we tried to not have it sort of imposed too much on these sort of existing uh, qualities, but also not be um, too, too bland, perhaps. So we're working with these different uh, colors and delineations and uh, plaster effects, but also difference in uh, reliefs and um, in painted wood on the on the doors. So this is the sort of street facade. So two very small projects at the end. Um, this was a very uh, quick and, and um, tiny competition. For some reason, they had a competition. This, of course, is Ivert Engbom's concert house in Stockholm and this great marketplace in front of it with this uh, very beloved stair on the concert house. Um, there was a distinct paving on the floor of the square that was added in when, when um, the area was redeveloped in the 50s, 60s. And of course, it, it might be a little silly to think that you would have a competition for a temporary portal when you have this kind of, um, well, you have the colonnade by Tengbom already. But of course, there is a kind of a long uh, tradition of making this again of uh, short-lived uh, temporary structures, uh, these kind of triumphal gates. This is from the Stockholm exhibition of uh, 1887. These are uh, kind of triumphal arches. They were probably not this big in the original, uh, only in these uh, drawings. But you would, they would uh, erect this kind of temporary. This is from the coronation of of Queen uh, Queen Christina. 
um, they would uh, erect this uh, for a temporary time and then it would have this kind of festive uh, character. So our proposal was to have something uh, of that nature. It's working, taking up some of these sort of shapes from the square, working with this um, uh, the great stair and, and some relation to that, those columns, but really like concave and convex forms um, also on the roof. Uh, it's very easily assembled and it has an important element in this sort of continuation of the, the stair towards the square perhaps. Uh, these are the elements and this is uh, of course the effect. So that was, uh, we're moving towards uh, smaller and smaller projects here. And at the final project I'm going to mention was um, a commission from Arctis, uh, which is here on this island, our National Museum of Architecture. Uh, they tasked some architects to uh, reimagine this uh, historically very important quay on the edge of the old city in Stockholm, which is um, historically was really the front of, of Stockholm where uh, the commerce was, was placed and all the boats could come from the different countries. But uh, nowadays it has turned into a long sort of parking space and our task was to try to reimagine what could, could it become. And of course we felt how, how could we, what does it mean? Stockholm is kind of a city built on water but it has lacked that kind of, you know, feeling at least in that place for a long time. So. Uh, we try to look a little bit at this sort of festivity of Venice. Uh, we try to look at these kind of structures that were these sort of bathhouses that were made uh, more like a hundred years ago. This is the Royal Navy, famous painting. Um, at the end, we sort of ended up with finding a kind of particular Stockholm uh, character in this uh, reference, uh, you can say works of art that we chose for the composition. And then we made this proposal of a kind of a radically open empty place and um, it would be served by having all the infrastructure put out in in the water uh, which we thought would be a delightful thing and it's interesting to, to look at this project now because of course uh, in times like these and in times like uh, the conditions we are now which is like the basis for this whole lecture series of course uh, with the pandemic um, uh, it's like our idea to propose a large open space was of course really like you would have an, an open space that could always be changing always be new you can have every kind of activity and you can have always have a lot of people and everyone could meet there and it could be a different thing a different day and so on and then you would have the infrastructure for that and it's uh, of course uh, both perhaps i don't know if it's reassuring or, or if it's a bit melancholic to think that this was only like a year ago when that would have been the sort of natural uh, essence of the public space, uh, we thought at least to, to put back into the center. And with that, uh, I, uh, I'm finished. Thank you. Samuel, fantastic. If you stop sharing your screen, then uh, we can see you. Um, yeah, if you have questions, just uh, let me know in the, in the chat box, please. Um, Samuel, I, I was just, I was intrigued, you're, you've clearly got this profound interest in the history of architecture and, and in the craft of architecture. And I wondered about um, the nature of building in Sweden, the part of the capacities of the Swedish construction uh, culture. Uh, mm -hmm. do you find, um, uh, yeah, is, is that a sympathetic environment to pursue an interest in craft or, or and? A kind of subsidiary question, perhaps. I mean, it's a country famously with very high environmental standards, and um, you know, an early pioneer of of, um, of kind of super insulation. And I wonder to what extent those sort of technical requirements have kind of shaped the kind of architecture you've developed over the past ten years. Yes. Um, well, I think a lot of the conditions that that really sort of define the possibilities that you have are, are not only in those performance aspects, but it's also in things like uh, regulations and, uh, you know, uh, in those industrialized aspects of, of how to make it and also the uh, market driven aspects of it. So in a sense, it's a, it's a little bit like, uh, it's not necessarily the fact that it would be 
too expensive to, to, to make something uh, craft-wise as part of a project, but I think in many ways it's it's like there is no really sort of cultural uh, cultural continuity for the clients and authorities to the, sort of see that as a possibility. So I think it's sort of almost like they, they wouldn't even know what to uh, to ask for in, in that regard. So uh, there is a kind of um, alienation there perhaps, which I don't know if it necessarily has to do with the fact that we have to build very efficient buildings and so on. It, it, it has a little bit also to do with, uh, I'm guessing some kind of cultural um, aspect around you know how to discuss architecture and what, what what you want from it so and I think at least for us it's like if you want to be an architect in Sweden you have to be a kind of a, a diplomat in a sense or you have to be able to you can't really be this kind of a, a, you know demonic uh, <laughs> strong uh, super architect who just uh, tells people what to do you have to be very sort of uh, you know you have to move in many different realms to, to be able to sort of steer the thing towards the thing that you are interested in. And then hopefully that people then, of course, what you, uh, you're steering it so that they will appreciate it when, it when it is there, even if they couldn't sort of uh, envision it from the, from, the, from the start. So, yes, I mean, we have a high standard in many ways now and, and, and it is in limiting in a sense from one, aspect of the architectural but but it's i think it's mostly i think really it has to do with a lot of really basic stuff like what do you want to do and how do you want do you want the building to be you know varied or uh very regulated do you want it to be sort of composed or uh, assembled i don't know it's it's um i think those things you could do in any system in a sense uh, and in any time and so I think it's a rather open field uh, there. Um, we've got a question from James Payne. James. Hello, Samuel. Thanks very much for the talk. Um, I just had a question um, really relating to your earlier talks in the series um, about your, your, your Instagram accounts and the, you know, the, the travels that you've done, the photographs you've taken of buildings. And it seems to be that you always have an ambition in the, in the projects that you've shown to make these civic facades, even if it's a private project, whether they're facades to the city or internal kind of civic rooms. And it seems to be these facades sometimes are very thin um, and sometimes they become much deeper. And I, I kind of sensed um, perhaps in the more civic buildings, the, the deeper facades had something to do perhaps with uh, the work of Rudolf Schwartz or even Livio Vicchini, that the, these facades actually start to become structure and tectonic and, and, and start to become um, structures that go inside the buildings. Is that, is that something that you've consciously thought about as, as perhaps you have more budget with a, with a more civic proposal? I, I mean, I think that would be very interesting. I also think, of course, I, I mean, there is some uh, in in the kind of public buildings and, and in those building buildings that you mentioned with Schwartz and and, um, and Vakini and, and those uh, it's they're also possible for more people to sort of relate to and uh, enjoy perhaps use uh, many times things like housing or a preschool of course is mostly mostly for the the person who are actually sort of living there or, or going there and so on and they're not of in the way things are nowadays when we're not sort of building in the centers anymore we are building in the sort of periphery and then it is a little bit like perhaps people yeah i, I think perhaps it would be more appropriate to use those you know special fuller uh, possibilities when uh, it would be be able to be used more intensely let's say by by uh, by the public and so on so i yeah, I feel I, I don't feel like they they wouldn't have any place in housing or anything like that now nowadays. I mean, if if we could, we would do much deeper, richer, uh, special arrangement also in in housing. But I mean, both uh, energy, economic, and other reasons, it's more. Yeah, we have to do with with some other uh, you know um, uh, desired effects there, but. 
I think that is a, a, a part of the promise of or um, desire of, of working with some some of those you know possibly civic buildings that they could have a bit more of that uh, strangeness or you know uh, particular character. Um, it is a bit more difficult to do that in in housing and so on, but I mean, there are many times when you look at historic uh, housing parts where actually having kind of modest buildings be doing some things, but not too many things, it actually makes a, a really great city also. So it doesn't necessarily have to mean that it's a failure for a housing project to have that kind of quality, but I think uh, it would be exciting to do that more for sure in, in more complex situations. And we've got one from Sarah Handelman, Sarah. Hi Samuel, thank you for your talk. Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, my question I think uh, builds off of what James was asking. Um, it's also connected to the, to the way you use photography um, and the, your position within the city when you're using it. Um, the way uh, you seem to be presenting your encounters with buildings in the city is very much from uh, a ground point of view. You are, your position is very clear. You're the person on the street. And uh, the photograph is used to, in a way, um, survey the external qualities of the building and mm -hmm. um, position in relation to other buildings or uh, its site in the city. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about how the way you are using this technique to, in a way, survey buildings, um, how does that positioning of you as this person on the street, um, this position of the ground and um, the role of the frame, how do those encounters, I guess, play into what you are designing? Well, <clears throat> it's an interesting uh, uh, question there. I, I think w what I what I think a little bit about when you uh, when you frame the question is a little bit like I feel a strong. It's like when you're documenting buildings or, or you're experiencing buildings or just going around. There is a you have this sort of sensation a lot of times like. Um, you come to a part of a place and then you get the sensation or get the relation to the building and you can sort of feel almost like the, that the intent of the architect is that you are going to feel that when you come to that point or so, you know, this kind of, so it, it, in a sense, it's a little bit like a game. It's a little bit like the architect is, is throwing a ball and you're catching it or you're doing something else or you're not catching it. I mean, you're having a kind of, uh, relationship, uh, direct relationship in a sense with that architect or that uh, builder, even if the building is, you know, 800 years old or, or 80 years old or 80 years old. Um, so in a sense, I think you have a lot of that, those qualities also when you're designing architecture, that the architecture we design isn't really, you know, um, to be understood simply on a sort of conceptual level. I mean, you can work with those aspects as well, but uh, it's, it is going to become something that the, the, that person or other persons are going to stand in front of and relate to, of course. Uh, so I think there is kind of a, a great energy there between uh, what you're doing when you're experiencing a building and designing a building. It's kind of an interrelation or a kind of continuous play, uh, really. Uh, it's like a, a delightful delightful game in a sense.